It's been 10 years since Shigeru Miyamoto talked about his long-term plan. It's time to look back and see what he was aiming to do, what he achieved, and what the impact was, plus what lessons we can learn going forward. Welcome to another Nintendo Forecast. So, let's zoom back in time to the October 2014 Investor Q&A. This was a particularly revealing one with Satoru Iwata as well as Genya Takeda from the hardware perspective and Shigeru Miyamoto from a software perspective called to discuss how they manage development costs. In terms of the escalating costs of AAA titles, I have another video coming up deep diving those particular challenges, but the key question that was asked was about increasing development efficiency. Quite a nuanced response that sets the context. Satoru Iwata said that, we quite agree with your point that we need to improve game development efficiency where necessary. On the other hand, what our consumers are looking for is not merely a great number of games. What is critical to us is that each consumer feels that the content of the games he or she plays is sufficient and that when the player has completed one game, the next one is offered at the right time. We don't believe that simply increasing the number of games or just containing the development costs per game are necessarily good for our company because if we try to simply decrease the per software development cost just for the sake of minimizing overall costs, the final product will become less appealing and it will not sell over a long period after its release. On the other hand, when there is software that sells for a long period of time or is talked about for a long period of time, this can increase consumers' motivation to continue playing these games and invite new purchasers. Even if we increase the total number of games, it does not make sense if each one of them becomes less compelling for the consumer. This is clearly reflected in the games that were being developed and released for the founding of the Nintendo Switch. From Breath of the Wild and Animal Crossing New Horizons to Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and Super Mario Odyssey, you can see the shift to fewer, larger titles and the move away from the kind of repeated iterative installments that you saw particularly with the new Super Mario Brothers series. Partly this was a function of the longer development times, but the notion of having one key entry per console for all but the most significant titles really has become something crucial to Nintendo, something they recommended to Ubisoft prior to the release of Mario Plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope and which Ubisoft felt may have accounted for Sparks of Hope's initial disappointing debut. So, now we get to Shigeru Miyamoto's key comments. As for the time needed to develop software, our software developers have mastered new skills and processes. Accordingly, the development delays while software developers get accustomed to new hardware is not anticipated. Our theme today is how effectively we can materialize our experiences to commercialize our products. This is something I often internally refer to as spin-off software. But while we make the most of our major games franchises, we want to support our character IP and increase the number of games we develop and release by also creating relatively smaller scale, but fun to play games. We're making preparations to release software within a franchise so that fans of the series will not need to wait for, say, three years in order to play a new experience in that franchise. Finally, even when creating our own franchises, we have been working with a number of outside companies. Looking at this year alone, we have started to work with second and third party companies that have not that we have not collaborated with before. Since we can collaborate with an increasing number of outside companies, we are now making progress to develop a number of games that will become key software for us. I have a solid feeling we you will have a rich software lineup in 2015. We will do our best. So here we can see the plan that was starting to be sketched out in 2014. Develop fewer, larger tentpole titles with real scope and ambition. Supplement those titles with spin-offs expanding their key franchises in different ways by tapping into the skills of second and third parties. Incidentally, I know the term second party is the subject of a lot of debate, and it's curious that the translation uses it here, although perhaps any Japanese speakers might be able to comment on whether this was used in the original. First party would be Nintendo themselves, third party would be companies that are not Nintendo, and in theory that covers all 100% of companies. They're either Nintendo or they're not. Having said that, I do think second party can be a useful term, for a number of companies who have incredibly close relationships with Nintendo to the extent that they are treated to all intents and purposes like first party and even work in the same building. 
for example HAL, the Pokemon company, and Intelligent Systems, who sometimes produce third-party games but are so tight to Nintendo products that they effectively are producing first-party content and first-party intellectual property almost full-time. Plus, there are also companies that grew ever closer to Nintendo over this period, although Next Level Games had developed some Nintendo titles in 2014, such as both the Mario Strikers titles, Punch-Out, and the recent at the time Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, they had also developed in the prior few years for Activision and Ubisoft, but the team evidently showed that incredible talent and the nurturing of that relationship with Nintendo led to Nintendo taking the very unusual, for them, step of buying the company outright. Identifying which tentpole titles came out is kind of obvious looking back, but let's really drill down into the spin-offs and the smaller titles that Nintendo have put out from 2014 to the present and see what connections they've made and how effective these experiments were. Evidently, an early example of this from 2014 itself was Koei Tecmo's original Hyrule Warriors title. Warriors titles are essentially a dime a dozen, so partnering with Nintendo was a fairly obvious move for Team Ninja. Nintendo had the assets, and Koei Tecmo had the game structure and the fanish passion to do tributes to these classics. We've seen two Hyrule Warriors titles on Switch, two Fire Emblem Warriors titles, and of course, Koei Tecmo's involvement in supporting Fire Emblem Three Houses had the knock-on benefit that they were able to develop Fire Emblem Warriors 3 Hopes into the bargain. This is certainly a model for effective link-ups, and one that to some extent I can see modelled elsewhere. Think about the 99 games, Tetris 99, Pac-Man 99, F-Zero 99, and Super Mario Bros. 35. Granted, not all of these used purely first-party IP, but the concept was one, like the Warriors games, that could be easily plugged in to a number of different titles and create compelling games. I think we saw an attempt at the same thing with Super Mario Maker. The original game was, by the admittedly dire standards of the Wii U, a startling success, and so one could be forgiven for thinking that this would be the start of a bold new wave of Maker games. The fact that EPD 10 prioritised Super Mario Maker 2 over an original 2D Mario game, and the fact that Link's Awakening had a Dungeon Maker grafted onto it, clearly shows that interest was there in the mid-2010s in cultivating this particular line of spin-off titles with Nintendo. Whether or not in another world this would have led to Zelda Maker, Mario Kart Maker, even Pikmin Maker or Metroid Maker, it's impossible to say, but just as the Warriors brand has expanded from Zelda to Fire Emblem, it's possible to imagine a world where the Maker brand also expanded and Zelda Maker and some other makers became a real thing. Sadly for Maker fans, this seems to have been brought to an abrupt halt by the decent but hardly world-beating response to Super Mario Maker 2 and the lukewarm reaction to the Link's Awakening Dungeon Maker. I think Super Mario Maker 2 is hugely underrated and even the Dungeon Maker is quite good fun, although admittedly with only limited potential. But for now, I think the Maker dream is probably dead, or at least a sleeping walrus. Keeping with the Zelda team though, Nintendo also contracted Tantalus, to develop the Twilight Princess HD remake and renewed that link for Skyward Sword HD, as well as continuing to deepen their relationship with Grezzo. They had been working with the company since Ocarina of Time 3D, which released in 2011, but by giving them a new title to develop in Triforce Heroes and then a remake in Link's Awakening, which required more fundamental graphical overhauling than either of their N64 ports, Grezzo were really given a chance to show their abilities. Also, 2019's real surprise Zelda announcement was probably Brace Yourself Games, Curse the Necrodancer, Cadence of Hyrule, which managed to combine the lovely art style reminiscent of Minish Cap, the amazing Zelda music library, and the brilliant rhythm gameplay to create one of the low-key hits of the era. Nintendo has done quite a few projects working with indie, or at least small-scale developers in recent times, Snipper Clips, The Stretchers, and Good Job being just three examples, but this was different in that they used Nintendo IP to start with. It seems that in this case, Nintendo received a pitch from the developers at Brace Yourself Games, to make some kind of DLC, little expecting that the concept would swell to the point of being a title in its own right. The comment from Toshihisa Nikaido at Spike Chunsoft, Brace Yourself's development partners, certainly suggests this. He said in an interview with Japanese website 4gamer.net, Originally, when the project was initially launched, it was talked about whether it would be possible to collaborate with The Legend of Zelda as download content for Necrodancer. When I took that plan to Mr. Nintendo, and talked, the story became louder and louder, and finally it was, would this be formed as a single, independent game? Studios pitching to Nintendo doesn't seem to be an isolated experience. Mercury Steam pitched a Metroid Fusion remake to Nintendo around 2015, and although Nintendo declined that game, Metroid Samus Returns and ultimately Metroid Dread came along as a result. 
This partnership has proven able to give a massive new lease of life to 2D Metroid. Of course, neither of these are spin-off titles, but full fat mainline entries. However, they did toy around with a less successful Metroid spin-off in the ill-fated and much maligned Metroid Prime Federation Force. It's curious that Metroid demonstrates the glory and the failure of both parts of Miyamoto's plan. Reaching out to promising third-party studios, or at least allowing third parties to pitch, clearly had a huge benefit for 2D Metroid, but trying to expand Metroid in new ways proved ill-advised for Metroid Prime. The same can be said for the poorly received Hey Pikmin, the forgotten Star Fox Guard, and the flat-out hated Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival, though Happy Home Designer had a more pleasant landing and shows that spin-off titles between major releases can be a good idea. It would be a mistake to think that all of the spin-offs were Hyrule Warriors levels of success though. Even 2024's Princess Peach Showtime seems to be met with a rather muted critical reception, and Tokyo Mirage Sessions may have received great critical acclaim, but it sank without a trace sales-wise on Wii U, and it's not clear the Switch port exactly set the world ablaze either. Still and all, experimentation gave us some of the company's biggest hits like Luigi's Mansion, and while Pokemon's many and varied spin-offs would be too many to explore in this particular video, anything discussing the success of spin-offs and international partnerships would be incomplete without mentioning what seems to have been a particular passion of Satoru Iwata, who up to his death was reportedly giving detailed feedback and advice to Niantic for the development of Pokemon Go. So how has the Miyamoto plan worked? Well, in terms of partner studios, very well. Whether it's Aiting providing an increasing level of support for the core team on Pikmin 4, Next Level Games becoming a Nintendo studio, or Mercury Steam developing a closer relationship to Nintendo through two, and hopefully soon to be three, successive 2D Metroid titles, there has been a successful expansion of Nintendo's partnerships, and reportedly, this is only going to escalate as Nintendo leverages the success of the Switch and their deep library of IP to explore new options going forward. As for the spin-offs, the picture is patchier. Bayonetta Origins, Cerise and Lost Demon, and Princess Peach Showtime are the most recent new spin-offs to be minted, but if you consider that any new title is a bit of a risk doing spin-offs that burnish the credentials of side characters, especially characters like Princess Peach, who had a major media profile thanks to the Super Mario Bros. movie, seems like a risk that it's worth continuing to take. On the other hand, some of the properties seem to have gone in reverse. Kirby had a whole slew of smaller titles like Kirby Battle Royale, Kirby Blowout Blast, and Kirby Fighters 2, but with the sad death of Van Poole, video up here for interest in the details of that, the pink puffball seems to have retrenched towards more core experiences, and actually taking the Iwata advice to do fewer but bigger games definitely worked for them in the astonishingly brilliant Kirby and the Forgotten Land. I don't think Kirby is done with weird spin-offs, Kirby's Dream Buffet certainly showed they still have an interest, but it's possible that the range of these smaller projects will dissipate if HAL can have success with mainline titles and sustain themselves that way. So where to now for spin-offs? Well, firstly, let's look at new spin-offs. With 2024's Princess Peach Showtime, 2023's Bayonetta Origins, 2022's Kirby Dream Buffet, and Pokemon Unite in 2021, Nintendo seems to have about a spin-off title every year. It's not a surefire thing, especially if the new console lineup contains more certain propositions, so I'll duck it down to a 70% chance that there will be an original spin-off title releasing before the end of 2025, and a 90% chance that there will be at least one such game before the end of 2026. In terms of which franchises are likely to get the nod, the overwhelming expectation has to be Pokemon and Kirby, who have always been engines of different, smaller titles. I would say before the end of 2027, there's a 50% chance there will be a new Pokemon spin-off line, especially with the 30th anniversary around the corner, while the loss of Vanpool means I'm going to say just a 30% chance for Kirby, who, after all, could keep the diversity of the title simply by nursing along existing spin-offs like Kirby Fighters, or even bringing out older ports such as Kirby Air Ride. Mario titles are higher profile, and the Super Mario movie has certainly opened up new potential, but actual spin-offs in the franchise are not quite as common in recent years. There's Captain Toad Treasure Tracker in 2014, Super Mario Run if you define that as a spin-off, which I guess is a bit up for debate, Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle in 2017, and Mario Kart Live Home Circuit, which similarly exists as a bit of a grey area, but I would argue counts as an original Mario Kart spin-off title, and now of course we've got Princess Peach Showtime. In any given year, you can work this out as a roughly 30% chance of an original 
Mario spin-off, but the new system but until the new system launches, they may not want to get too experimental with the plumbing prodigy. Therefore, I'd put it at a 30% chance that there will be an original Mario spin-off before the end of 2025, but I'd expect the chances to increase over time and I would give it a 50% chance that there will be one before the end of 2026. Zelda has more potential perhaps. Triforce Heroes is in that grey area of being kind of in the four sword tradition of 2D multiplayer titles, but Cadence of Hyrule clearly stepped into a whole new field. Okay, I'm now jumping into my own video several weeks after it was first recorded because, of course, I can't go any further with this video without acknowledging Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom. Is Echoes of Wisdom a spin-off title? I don't think that you can truly say that it is. After all, it is given the Legend of Zelda title itself and, frankly, it's always been an oddity that the title character and the lead character of this series are not the same, so it would feel churlish to deny the Hylian Princess her moment in the sun. Nevertheless, this does seem to be a mechanically quite different Zelda from ones we've had previously, but perhaps only in the sense that they all are. After all, the Echo abilities gifted by the Tri-Rod feel similarly consequential and game-changing as Ultra Hand was in Tears of the Kingdom. That is to say, it does blow open the way the game is played in a free manner, but still nestles into the existing gameplay type as an extra element. It's clear that this utilizes assets from Link's Awakening in new and exciting ways, and so truly this does earn its classification as a sequel to the previous Zelda titles. That said, I think it does fit into the Miyamoto vision, as it's definitely a case of expanding the concept of what the Zelda IP can sustain by putting a different character in the lead, and my hunches at the big end now recognise that having a wider variety of characters mainlining their franchises and investing in these characters can be of long-term benefit for them. After all, if and when the film drops, they'll want to promote not just Link's adventures, but Zelda's too, and that will be difficult to achieve at present. At best, while not a spin-off, I do wonder if Echoes of Wisdom has the potential to be like Super Mario Land 3, Super Wario Land, or Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. Backdoor pilots for spin-offs within the existing series. It could well be that the future of 2D games is with Zelda in the lead, or even a collaboration between Link and Zelda using a two-player mechanic if both of them can end up with different yet satisfying playstyles. One reservation I often have with a lot of the female characters in the game worlds being promoted to lead, so Amy Rose and Princess Peach both springing immediately to mind, is that the characters often weren't designed to be action heroes initially, and so retrofitting them to be so can appear really awkward. I know Amy's mallet has been around so long that it seems a natural part of her, but I remember it seeming quite weird as a conceit in the Sonic the Fighters arcade game that the professional hostage from Sonic CD was now an action heroine wheeling a mallet, which didn't seem particularly Sonic-y. And Amy is still to this day different from Sonic, Tails and Knuckles in needing a weapon to battle, something that the more modern female characters in Sonic titles generally don't. However, the Zelda team have absolutely smashed it with their use of the Tri-Rod. Zelda's thing isn't courage, but wisdom, and this allows for combat to be an integral part of the game in a way that perfectly, absolutely perfectly meshes with Zelda's existing character and lore. I will be so intrigued to see how this plays out, but it strikes me that mechanically they've turned combat itself into another type of puzzle, which is brilliantly fitting for both the character and the game series. As to other spin-offs in the Zelda field, the relatively low number of Zelda releases in any given year means that the likelihood that any one will be a true new spin-off has to be quite low. 2014 and 2019 are the only years where we've had something spin-off like in the Zelda field recently, and if you do count Echoes of Wisdom as anything remotely spin-off like, you might consider that this five-year tick box has been checked, and it will be 2029 before Aonuma Sound's team try to shake things up. While I don't think that the team are quite as schematic in their approach to spin-offs as this, and the 40th anniversary in 2026 does represent a fertile period for them to try to expand the Zelda property out a little, I'd say a new Zelda spin-off by the end of 2028 is only a 30% chance right now. Although, of course, they could try to resurrect a past spin-off if they feel the world needs a little bit more tingle in its life. Incidentally, I will say that the spin-off I've always really longed for in the Zelda field 
is a Wolf Link title. I just think a game that retells the Zelda lore but with the characters as wolves and boars 100% of the time, really building the whole game around playing as animals and what that would mean could be really fascinating, although I don't see it as likely anytime soon. All things considered, it seems that Miyamoto's decade-long plan is now bearing considerable fruit and has been a great success for the company so far. It is great to see Nintendo building ever more partnerships with other studios, with Mercury Steam, Grezzo, Next Level Games and others having become really key alliances over the past decade. And I would love to see in the coming years partnerships such as with Ating on Pikmin, WayForward on Advanced Wars and new studios still becoming entrenched. As for spin-offs, they continue to expand their characters out in new and exciting ways and I think the momentum of this kind of thing will only pick up as they pivot to having an even greater focus on film and television content and so I will be very excited to see how some of the more second tier characters step into the spotlight in the years ahead. For more on Nintendo's development partnerships, this playlist has you covered and please subscribe to come back for future videos including examining who might be Mario and Luigi's new developers. Thank you for watching and I will see you soon for another Nintendo Forecast.